Don't forget to like and subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a remarkable individual joining us on the show. Born in India and transplanted to Canada during his formative years, our guest journey embodies the essence of resilience and adaptability. His narrative isn't one of overnight success, but rather a testament to the trials and tribulations of pursuing one's passion. Moving continents meant bidding farewell to all things familiar, but it also sparked an unexpected journey of self-discovery. Far from home and longing for connection, he found solace in the reels of India and Hollywood cinema, sparking a fascination that would shape his future endeavors. As he navigated through university life at York, his love for film flourished, resulting in the creation of a club that united movie aficionados and fostered a community. It was during these years that the seed of filmmaking was planted, and despite initial setbacks, his determination remained unwavering. Undeterred by challenges, he embarked on a journey of self-education, devouring literature and immersing himself in the craft. From humble beginnings of crafting comics, the university's newspaper, to venturing into the world of independent filmmaking, each endeavor served as a stepping stone towards its ultimate goal. Now, with a blend of scientific precision and artistic flair, our guest has honed his skills, each project a testament to his growth and evolution as a filmmaker. From humble beginnings to the release of his most ambitious work yet, his journey is a testament to the power of perseverance and pursuit of one's passion against all odds. Please join me in welcoming the director and writer behind the thought-provoking films, The Intextigators 1, 2, 3, currently in production number 4, and Optilus, John Babu. John, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for that very articulate uh, description of me. <laughs> you know, John, I want to dive into it with you here. You moved from India to Canada on your own before smartphones and social media were are what they are today. And then um, you dove into cinema and became this connection with movies now i want to ask why movies why not books why not art why not a museum why not anything else i moved here when i was young i didn't move by myself i moved with my parents i was uh, in my teens back then i suppose when you're that age uh, movies are more accessible it's easier to get into museums would probably require a bit more maturity to fully appreciate the meaning of it and books i'm not that big of an avid reader um, I do read, but then I watch more movies than I do read books. And um, yeah, that's probably why movies were a charm. Also, um, the thing with language barriers, uh, movies are more accessible in that they have subtitles and then you can really see what's happening. Whereas a lot of books, um, yeah, they're in different languages. So immediately that's a barrier right there. Right. So that those reasons, yeah, played a part in why movies first. Now, are you able to walk through us your journey from being a university student to becoming a filmmaker? Um, so it's still a process. I'm still in the process of becoming a uh, university student. Um, so I am a science student. So I studied biology uh, and minored in psychology when I was in university. Uh, at the beginning, when I started, I went to York University, which is a huge school. Uh, the student body is 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, however it is. So it was a huge transition. Uh, I was a bit lost and it was very difficult to make friends at the beginning and I was overwhelmed. So it started off as student clubs. So there were already student clubs at York and there are so many student clubs uh, catered to different hobbies, different interests. I was going to a few movie nights hosted mm -hmm. by a few student clubs and I would take some friends with me, dates and so on. And then uh, I remember at the end of my second year, uh, or beginning of my second year, uh, some of the clubs that used to host these movie nights stopped movie nights completely, which was when uh, I decided, well, why don't I jo uh, make my own club? Why don't I found my own club? And I did uh, find a club, Movies at York was its name. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a general club for all the student membership. And then we had movie nights. We collaborated with uh, people like Sony Pictures Canada, Warner Brothers, and so on at the time to promote some of their movies. Uh, and um, we also collaborated with other clubs on campus, like the Disney Club, the Harry Potter Club, and so on, and hosted uh, movies relevant to both. Um, so yeah, it was, an, it was a passion that sort of uh, went together uh, with my university days. Uh, I was looking at the more informal uh, watching for not movie files, just casual viewers, but also taking seriously 
about the craft of filmmaking and watching some more serious, mature films and so on, right? So yeah, it, it was a journey that went together. If that makes sense, yes. Now, when we talk about your background in the sciences, how has this uh, influenced your approach to filmmaking? Uh -huh. So at the beginning, I wasn't thinking much about um, the common aspects of it, but now I'm starting to see when I look back more about the influence. Uh, so a lot of things. So for example, science, um, if you remember back in high school and so on, when, whenever you answer to science, it's point form. Right? You cannot go on and on and on forever. You find the major points and then you can even condense it into bullet forms and then you do that. Uh, a lot of my scripting, et cetera, tend to be like that. Um, so I find the, the objective of the scene and I try to convey that in the minimal resources as possible, time, dialogue as well, um, and so on. Uh, even when I um, produce, I also produce my films so the logistics of it. So I'm very streamlined in my process where I think, oh, this is what we should have. And then I work backwards as uh, to the goal and then work in, in terms of that. Uh, a lot of my, the themes and the, the plots and concepts of my films as well, they are essentially taking a science concept, which is well established, and then taking that and running with it, right? So they're sci-fi or um, rooted in things with evidence and so on. Uh, it was not planned. But when I look back, I see the clear um, sort of inspiration from my science backdrop and so on. Now, I want to go back a step here. You, we had talked about you founded the movies at your club, and it did grow to have a significant following. I believe at one point you had 100 uh, members there. But I want to know, how did this experience shape your understanding of audience engagement and community building within the realm of film? Like you had 100 plus people at your movie nights and you're showcasing these movies and now you're a filmmaker. What did you learn from that audience engagement and communication aspect? Right. So around 500, I think, was the membership. But then, yeah, serious members would come watch, yeah, hundreds or so. Um, so you get diff the club itself was a general membership club. It was open to anybody, not just film students, not just um, movie files and so on. So um, we, we would have to interact with different sorts of audience. So when we had a Disney club, for example, the, the audience would come in would be specifically fans of Disney or casual movie course. But then suddenly when you play a Godfather or Heat or something, which we've done, the audience will be very different, right? And I would be sitting in most of these movie nights and would be watching the film and the reaction of the audience to these films as well. And then I sort of appreciated the the um, tremendous diversity a movie can achieve and the different segments of an audience that a movie could appeal to, right? That was, that was an overwhelming uh, feeling for me. I remember watching, I think it was um, uh, The Lion King when a character dies and then, I have watched The Lion King when I was young, but I don't much remember it. Uh, but when I was watching it and I saw there were children actually crying when one of one of the characters dies, that was overwhelming because um, here it was just a film and it was an animated film too and not even human characters, right? It were animal characters, not even domestic animals. They were animals that you would see in the wild. Um, the fact that it could move an audience to tears, right? So such such moments were really, really overwhelming it was inspirational uh, to as to the power of what a movie could achieve and then since I was the president of the club I would have to also interact with people like from Sony Pictures or Warner Brothers or Skyfall or Cloud Atlas these are all films that I think we have promoted for uh, those studios yeah so we would have to decide um, where to set up tables and how best to uh, market those films and then we would get some things in return as well. We would get merchandise, the t-shirts and pens and so on from those uh, films. So so it would be looking at these things from completely different points of view. You need to think about the audience in mind, but you also need to think about the finances in mind and the logistics in mind. So yeah, um, so you get a greater sense of the movie making industry and the business as a whole and everything. It's not just about oh, watching movies and everyone relaxes, but there's also a well-planned aspect to it and logistic aspects to it. You need to uh, appreciate the audience itself and the trends and patterns, these sort of things. So yeah, that's what Movies Zero did to me. Okay. Now, when we talk about these business side of filmmaking, 
right? There's the, there's the creative side and art for art. And hey, I can't wait to show the world my artistic vision. And then as you mentioned, there's this whole business side of it as well. At what point do the do the lines blur of business versus art? Have you have you come across those challenges yet? Um, uh, I guess it depends on the filmmaker. For me, I don't make uh, movies just to make money uh, because I make short films. There's not that much money in short films anyway. Um, but then, uh, yeah. So for example, once when you it starts when you conceive a project, mm -hmm. um, when you get the idea and when you start writing, and it helps uh, because I am a writer as well as a director as well as a producer. So I sort of, even when I start thinking about a project, I get a sense of, oh, where is this project going to end up? Who's the audience, et cetera. Uh, so I, I, every step of my way is informed in that sense. Uh, but yes, so when whenever we write certain scenes, uh, we always think, okay, is this going to appeal to a wider section of the audience, mm -hmm. sort of? But then it's impossible to fully predict that as um, a writer, because you can only think for one or a few people that you have met in your own life. Um, but then it comes um, after you release a project or when, when you finish the project, when you contact a few film festivals or whoever is willing to promote the film, mm -hmm. then you think about their audience and you need to, um, to, to cater your uh, request so that uh, there's something in it for them as well. So if, if it's a horror film, let's say, and if the person you're contacting uh, to screen or to promote in their magazine or whatever, if it's not a horror specific uh, magazine, then you need to uh, change your wording a bit and you need to find the angle that they are uh, going for, right? So you need to be adaptable in that sense. You need to be open-minded. You cannot just be thinking about my art. This is the major theme. Uh, you need to be finding sub themes in there or themes that are not explicitly visible. And then you need to highlight those, right? So yeah, in that sense, knowing your project inside out helps. Um, yeah, in order to understand the needs of the specific interaction and then modify your project and your request according to that, yeah. So John, as we talk about the creation of filming here, how long does it take John to go from perception to pen to paper to hitting record? Okay, um, I'm a pretty slow <laughs> filmmaker. Um, on average, so I've been doing this for maybe 13 years or so, and I've averaged roughly one project every year. Nice. Um, so after I conceive an idea uh, to writing, it takes a lot of time for me because I usually jot these ideas down and then um, I don't give any deadlines. I just let it percolate in my notes or my thoughts or my books. And then when I get other ideas, which I feel could complement that, I write that down. Um, so maybe three or four months after I initially conceived on, on average, uh, if there's something exciting and if I've managed to build on to that idea and sometimes I share it with friends and so on. And if, if I see a spark in them as well i realize oh there's something in there that excites someone else as well not just me um so um yeah i let all these ideas stack up and then when i sit down to write it's usually a quick process for me writing um per se it's a pretty quick process i don't do too many drafts i do somewhere between two to six drafts that's that's all i do because when i sit down it's all sort of formed in me and going back to my science influence sometimes i draw graphs or um, I draw arrows or flow charts and so on in order to um, logically align all my thoughts. So the writing itself is pretty quick. Uh, and then once I write, it depends on the length of the project, the complexity of the project. The pre-production can take anywhere from one to four months or so. Mm -hmm. um, because since this is very indie, I need to message everyone myself. I'm the producer um, for all of these projects. And then I need to get locations and cast and crew and equipment and props and yeah. And then, yeah. And then the filming itself, again, we are the mercy of everyone's schedules. And a, a lot of people, uh, most of the time volunteer for me. So I cannot really um, ask them to take a leave or something. That would be very unfair, right? I wouldn't do that. So uh, to get the schedules of everybody and then we roughly have like one shoot day a month or so. And then the post-production another six months or so so roughly a year for every project 
but then depending on the project, then sometimes the production takes longer, sometimes the post-production, sometimes the pre-production, sometimes the writing, etc. Yeah, that's it. So John, I want to fast forward a little bit here because you have a project that I'm that I'm really excited to ask you about. Uh, the Intextigator. Now, this is a series, and you're on uh, series four with this, and it explores the theme of AI, a topic that has become increasingly relevant in today's society. So what inspired you to devolve into this subject matter of AI and, you know, to give it away, police investigations, if you guys haven't seen The Intextigator, make sure you find an opportunity to do it. Can you walk us through that? Right. So this is a project I conceived in 2019. This was before ChatGPT and um, the current uh, uptick in all these AI articles and so on. Um, so that project, I initially wanted to do a text only project at the time just to experiment and so on. And then I looked up various ideas mm -hmm. and then that's when it started uh, to dawn on me. So if you call Pizza Pizza, for example, uh, sorry, if you go to Pizza Pizza's website, I think they still have it, but they had it in 2019. Um, there is this um, chat bot that comes in and asks you, oh, what toppings are, do you like? And then you click the toppings and then it suggests, oh, this is a pizza you may be interested mm -hmm. in. It throws out an answer for you. Or if you call Apple, uh, they ask you, oh, which, what do you want to know? And then you say a thing and then it leads you to a certain place. So automation, uh, we are living in a time where it was getting, uh, everything is getting automated um, and we have machines doing more and more. So that was the inspiration. So I was thinking, okay, so that it's fine. No one's going to complain if Pizza Pizza does it or if Apple does it, but is there any area where we would be, uh, I uh, would be hesitant on, right? So what about cops? That's what I was thinking. Because we approach cops when we are at our most vulnerable. So at a time like that, are we okay with the idea that instead of talking to a human, we actually have an AI uh, leading us through this process? So that was the thought that sparked the whole thing. Uh, and then the pandemic happened in 2020, uh, early 2020. That is when uh, the first two investigators I filmed fully during the pandemic in 2020, it was... Uh, done purely sitting at home. So I got this idea, let's do it a text-based project. So it appears um, to the audience, if they watch it on their phone, they could sort of be in the shoes of the main character. Mm -hmm. And we can, it would be scary because we are fully uh, trapped in the phone and there's nothing else, right? Uh, we cannot even see anything. It's just text-based, right? And that's, in many ways, that is uh, what it feels like to be interacting with an AI. We cannot see where they're coming from. There's no non-verbal communication as it is for humans. We can sort of see their body language and gestures, but in the AI, we cannot have that, right? So that that's how it started. Um, and then as I did more films in Texigator 3 and so on, uh, I added more and more components to it and it became a series where we compared a human's approach to things versus a machine's or an AI's approach. So what makes us different from machines in general, right? And by doing that, we get a sense indirectly of what it means to be a human. Right? Mm -hmm. So we we think rationally, et cetera, but AI also does that. But we have emotions um, involved as well, which AI does not have. And then there are a lot of things that we have, we as humans have, which is uniquely human. So appreciation for art, for example, uh, or the fear of death, for example, or the ability to... Um, find the abstract and get meaning out of abstract or uh, metaphors and poetry and all these things. So yeah, that, that was the idea. It's a vast idea. I'm not the first person to think of these topics, but then um, I'm, I'm glad that I did. And I'm sure that such conversations will increase as we are getting much more uh, and more into, um, yeah, relying on AI with ChatGPT that was released a few years ago. Yeah, I got a feeling that I was on the right track because, uh, the world is going that way. <laughs> now, John, I want to ask you, we talked about uh, sparking these conversations and people walking away from your films with different thought-provoking aspects. So what message do you hope viewers take away from your work? Uh, from the Intexigator or in general, you mean? Well, for me, I'm a fan of the Intexigator, but from a general concept, uh -huh. what message do you want the audience to, would they leave that theater, they leave that screening? Mm -hmm. What do you want them to take away from it outside of being entertained? Uh-huh. So a lot of my films, they are pretty non-judgmental in the sense I don't give a strong opinion either way. And that's because these opinions, I don't feel they're black and white. They are, they, are, they have a lot of great shades. 
Um, so instead of dictating, oh, this is my opinion, you should be taking this particular vantage point home. It's more of informing them of this uh, thing, so AI and how it works and so on. Not from a technical point of view, but in general point of view. Uh, and even in Optimus, it's about the power of optical illusions and there's a potential in there. Mm -hmm. um, sure, some of it is fiction, but you know the, the basic underlying mechanisms are the, uh, theoretically evidence-based and soundproof. Uh, and then um, some pros and cons of both. Uh, is what I do present. And then it's up to the audience, honestly. Um, even if I do have some biases in these films, uh, they are meant to be subtle and they're not meant to be overwhelming. Uh, your opinion as to be biased towards one aspect. Uh, so the investigator, for instance, I sort of clearly show that there are some things that we are better at, but that there are some things that uh, we are not as good as. So someone could think of it and they could agree with me, disagree with me, or they could say, okay, uh, so the aspects that we are good at, we should be focusing on that uh, to you know, give to humans or the aspects that we're not that good at. For instance, um, we take breaks, uh, which AI does not need to. Uh, we don't, we get tired, but they don't. So things like that, the, the more um, monotonous, mundane things uh, we could outsource to an AI, but the more creative sides or the more, um, the thing that requires abstract out of the box sort of thinking, we could uh, approach a human, that sort of thing, but it's not um, explicitly in your face. It's more subtle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still growing as an artist, so I still haven't narrowed down that that style on preachiness versus too subtle and nobody understands anything. It's a tightrope that I try to walk on, yes. So, John, looking ahead, what are your aspirations for the future in your filmmaking career? Uh, so if you notice back to my films, it has grown in length and complexity with every project. So I started off with three-minute films that are not that good, one location and so on. Um, the Optilus, which I released a few months back, it's around 30 minutes. Um, so I, at some point, I do aspire to make a feature and transition into a feature filmmaker. Um but yeah, I believe that it should come uh, step by step. So I'm currently taking baby steps towards that. Uh, I do have some ideas, but then I, I feel that I need more experience and so on. So um, yeah, f feature films would be great. And then uh, continue to bridge a lot of scientific concepts with the artsy element and present the science topics to the audience. So that, uh, yeah, people appreciate science more and think about ways that science could be uh, used to enrich human life right that is sort of the, yeah the ballpark of my aspirations now john i want to ask you something a little bit more personal can you share with us something that scares you something that scares me <laughs> um i would say uh wasting one's time i guess I can, there are many things that scare me, but once you put me on the spot, wasting one's time in the sense that uh, we have a limited amount of time and it's one of the things that we cannot get back, right? Um, money, et cetera, we could you know, potentially get back. Um, so wasting one's time as in doing certain things that um, when we look back, we think, oh, I could have done something else and so on. Um, yeah, because lost time is not coming. Uh, so that that is one thing that scares me, yes. <laughs> So, John, when we talk about lost time, and I know there's multiple oh. things that scare a lot of people, what is oh. something that you would say people tend to misunderstand about you the most? Misunderstand about me the most. Um, let's see. Some, again, I, mean, I cannot speak for someone else, so I'm speaking from my perception of what I think others are thinking of me. <laughs> um, uh, so, some people... Let's say if I'm busy with a project or something that um, I may be too focused on it mm -hmm. and then I may zone out perhaps certain external aspects. So some people may think that I'm in my own world, not caring about uh, others or something, or I'm indifferent to uh, others' feelings and so on. So I would say in certain moments when I'm in the zone, uh, people may think of me as you know stuck up or um, not social or um yeah th things like that so uh yeah that that might be that that 
they might think that I'm a very serious guy or that I am too, <laughs> um, yeah, not concerned about the other side and so on. Yeah. No, that's fair. And, and John, I have time for one last question for you today on Coffee with Chris. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. But And the question I have for you, John, is what makes John smile? <laughs> well, this question just made me smile <laughs> unconsciously. Um, I'm pretty easy to, to smile. I'm not that um, cynical or anything. So I would say when I'm surprised in a pleasant way, so when I expect a certain thing, but then um, then I get something a bit more than I expected. And what one uh, technique to that is to expect very low, right? So the threshold is so low that uh, you get you see a lot of things that makes you smile. Uh, but yeah, people uh, make me smile because I go a neutral stance, and I I found that people generally um, good, and they are they rise above what you expect. Is what I personally feel. So yeah, people make me smile, or when I get something that I did not expect, uh, that makes me smile. A lot of things make me smile. I'm pretty easy to <laughs> to impress, yes. I love it. Low expectations and away we go. <laughs> neutral, neutral expectations. Neutral yes. expectations. <laughs> Zero, yes. Well, John, as I said to you, that was the last time a question I had for you. And John, where can people learn more about you? Um, so I am on social media. Um, my Instagram is at johnbabu1. Uh, so at John Babu one, uh, you can watch my films uh, on YouTube, uh, Paradiso Cinemas. But if you type in Intextigator, I think that would probably show up on the search algorithm better. So I N T E X T I G A T O R. Uh, yeah, those are two two ways that you can contact me. Fabulous, and John, thank you again so much for your time today. Remember out there, everyone, to smile to inspire, and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here.